Hi, welcome to Getting Started, a series of interviews about how inspiring people started their own careers and what advice they have for you to do the same thing. My name is David Newman. I'm co-founder of HAPS. And because of the advice and mentorship that I received from others, I've been fortunate to have had a fun and rewarding career. I created this series as a way to pay it forward and help others do the same thing. My guest today is an amazing writer-producer who has a career that has spanned four decades and just starting a fifth. Uh, he started, uh, well, close to started by writing the legendary Crush Groove and then had a career in comedy that took off. He worked on Married with Children, The Parkers, Moesha, and today he is doing a reboot of The Proud Family for Disney+. Plus. Um, I'd like to bring on my good friend and colleague, Ralph Farquhar. Ralph, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me, David. Uh, I don't know what I can add to the universe in, in terms of how to make it, uh, because I haven't made it yet myself. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you haven't made it, Ralph, there's, there's very little hope for the rest of us, but you're a modest man, and I appreciate that. Um, I am so, you know, I'm so curious, and I deliberately didn't ask you a lot of these questions because I realize I don't know the answer myself. I, as, as long as I've known you, and we've worked together on shows starting in the 90s, I, um, I, I don't know how you got started in the industry. How did you get started? Oh, gosh. How did I get started? Wow. Well, uh, Oh, wow. You know, I didn't know you were going to ask me that one. That, that's a, I, I have to remember. You can take it in pieces. It's uh, not meant to be a, a stumper, but just sort of how did you get started? Well, you know, I, you know, David, and uh, yeah, you're right. I don't know that we've ever talked about this, but, you know, I, um, you know, I was never um, intended for this business. Um, I, I got a degree in advertising communications from the University of Illinois. Uh, which I graduated from in 73 after I dropped out of West Point. So I was like, you know, from Chicago, show business, Hollywood, no one ever talked about it. And advertising was like considered a business, you know, Chicago's headquarters for a lot of big ad agencies. So Leo I, Burnett, most notably at that time. Right. Yep, yep absolutely. And so uh, I, tr I tried to get a job there. They wouldn't give me a job. They said you had to get a sales job then come back. I actually had a degree in advertising. I didn't understand that. I was one of the few people who had that at the time. There was only two schools you could get that degree in 73. So I, I lucked up and got a job that sent me out to California and, uh, you know, in sales. And you know what? After I got enough sales experience, I remember I went down to J. Walter Thompson. It was located on a, a Wilshire, the, the West Coast office. And when I had a wonderful interview, Lisa, oh, you're amazing. And said, just one other thing, you know, we need you to write like a five page essay of why you want a job in advertising. And I kind of looked at it. So I got a degree in it. I mean, you, who comes in here with a degree in it? I mean, what? I got to write. It threw me. I walked, I remember walking down Wilshire because <laughs> I was taking a the bus then. I was walking down Wilshire and I said, you know what? I don't think I want to do that. Uh, you know, I'm not writing the essay. I, come on, later with that. So, and uh, so I was trying to figure out what to do. I, you know, um, I eventually had to get another sales job. I was sitting in my apartment watching TV one day, and uh, a good friend of mine I've become friends with. When I left West Point, I lived on the Lower East Side of New York. New York it was Carl Franklin, who's pretty big time director, writer right now. He was an actor back then, and very you know, and become very successful. I turned on the TV and, and he was on TV. It was an old series with Stacy Keach, if you remember that name, I called do. Kareeb. And I, you know, so this is the day I just called up information, got Carl's phone number, called him up, said, Carl, man, you made it. Uh, congratulations, you know, and, you know, just a quick question. You know, how much money do they pay you to do that? And now you gotta understand. I made I cleared five hundred dollars every two weeks uh, on my sales gig. Couldn't spend all my money, and he said, "I remember he said five thousand dollars a week." Wow, and that's I, a lot of money now. I, I, hey man, I sat in front of the TV. You know, this is no VCR, no you know, 
you know, streaming anything. I'm just watching them every week for like two, three weeks. I say, you know, I think I at least have to try to do this for five grand. So that was my initial impetus. I I went down and uh, uh, enrolled in the Kilpatrick Cambridge uh, uh, Acting School, which was on the corner of uh, uh, San Vicente and Melrose. And I lived at the time I lived in Beverly Hills, so I used to pass it all the time. And needless to say, back in those days, I was probably like one of three black people I saw in that neighborhood. <laughs> but I was always passing this uh, uh, this building, and so it was an acting school. I said, well, let me go in there. I go in there, and it was owned by two black men. It was, you know, all, all the students were black. It was weird. I mean, this was like in the middle. It was all white, but there was this black acting school in West Hollywood. I was Interesting. like... Whoa. And that was that was my introduction. And I met everybody from there. And it was uh, 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 so my, my my entry was as an actor. And uh, just fast forward real quick. Uh, I I was only auditioning for Slave Number One, Slave Number One, Game Banger Number Three. Oh, geez. So I said, you know, I, I can I can do better than that. I can write something. I'm going to write myself a part. You know, you know how actors think. So yeah. I started writing. And what I discovered real quickly that just about anybody would talk to a writer, but nobody wanted to talk to an actor. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> and I found my, I, you know, I lucked up. I made, I had a friend that introduced me to a, a, another person who introduced me to another person. And I wound up, uh, uh, working for three women who were all married to very successful men in show business. I was their receptionist at their travel agency. Uh, 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 and this led to me meeting another uh, wonderful woman who introduced me to her husband, Walter Kempley, who was the executive producer of a show called Happy Days. And, wow. I, went to, and I went to meet with Walter and, you know, I didn't wear socks. He didn't wear socks. <laughs> He looked at me, he says, hey, what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I want to be a writer because I learned my lesson real quick. Nobody wanted to talk to actors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well he said, and he says, hey, well, you know, they got a great program here where, you know, uh, 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 for uh, uh, producers, you know, uh, uh, they for minority producers, a training program. I said, no, I don't want to do anything that says minority in front of me. <laughs> Oh, Could you please? <laughs> oh, I wonder if Alexa was, tre Alexa, was, was Alexa. triggered by the word minority or something like that. You know, maybe that was it. Is that uh, yours or mine? It's yours, I think. It, I don't think it's mine. Jesus, that was. That's funny, though. That's that, great. That, that was uh, OK. That's where we are. OK. <laughs> All good. But uh, you didn't want so you didn't want to you didn't want to go into that special training program. No, I, I didn't. I, I that was just not. Uh, I I even then I saw. Well, that's a little bit of a trap. Plus, uh, I realized uh, even then uh, I saw in the writers' room there were ten people, but every show only had one line producer. So I said, no, let me uh, 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 be the writer's assistant because he gave me an option of that, mm -hmm. and so that's so I got hired on Happy Days as a writer's assistant. Interesting. And, yeah. And so, who did you assist? Or was it were you assisting the whole team? Or was, were the, you the whole writing team? staff, except for nobody would I was six two black guy. They wouldn't ask me to type up anything. So I was just sitting there. <laughs> 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 it was interesting. So I was just sitting there writing my own scripts. And and, and, and that's so interesting. Um now I just want to back up. This is utterly fascinating, Ralph, and I've never heard it. And I'm I think it's gonna be very interesting to so many people. But are you meaning to tell me that as a kid, for instance, you didn't dream of being an actor or didn't dream of working in Hollywood? Was oh, no. that not was it was that not part of your consciousness at that time? No, I, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's how I wound up at West Point. At West when Point. I was a kid, all the first astronauts went to West Point. So that's I, I went there. I figured, but I, I was stupid because when I got there, they said, What do you want to do? I said, I want to be an astronaut. They said, Well, you, you're not going to fly anything around here. So <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so that was my dream. I, Interesting. Man, a show business. Look, David, I'm from Chicago. Uh, my parents, they were like, they thought it was a waste. When I did get into this business, they they gave me, you know, 
Like, what are you doing? You know? Yeah, right. You, you gave know, up like, a career at West Point for this. Yeah. That it, it, pretty much that's what they said. You know, did, they, did, they, did you they drop out of, why did you, if I may ask, why did you drop out of West Point? I, yeah, come on. Yeah, you've been with me. Can you imagine me at West Point? It <laughs> it's, was it's, it, it's, it's not the it doesn't align with the Ralph Farquhar I know, but I but I I'm you know curious. I, I mean I can think of lots of cool reasons to go, including being an astronaut. But I so you got there and you hated it. You didn't like military well, life. I, and you didn't. I didn't actually. I liked it, but I thought I really didn't take it seriously. So uh, I finally they used to you know when you're a plebe they were you would get rated by your classmates and and the classes above you. So as a plebe, you got rated by everybody. So they called me in one time and said, normally we kick people out because, you know, but you got 90% of the upperclassmen hate you, rated you in the bottom bottom part of your class, but 90% of your classmates rated you in like the top two. And I said, uh -oh. so we're not going to kick you out, but I want to read you what the upperclassmen wrote. And I remember one upperclassman wrote, said, Mr. Farquhar is the most notorious cadet to enter the United States Military Academy since Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> well, and that's, I was like, but that is both hilarious and ironic because, of course, <laughs> Mr. Poe being a writer. So that that's uh, it, it for it. So there's even foreshadowing. How's that for a layer of irony on the whole? Well, well story? And, and I took it as a compliment. They had a damn building named after him there. I was like, well, what, you know, <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, we have a, you know, one of the fun things about doing HAPS is we actually have all these commenters who are, you know, experiencing this with us. And one of our top commenters, Takara, said, at what point did your parents say, well, I guess we were wrong about that? Did that ever happen? Or is it sort of like Woody Allen where it's never actually happened? Well, yeah, they never really say anything. You know, I mean, but it wasn't just my parents. It was my aunts and uncles. I actually had a lot of relatives out here and they were very, very concerned. And uh, uh, it it was never, you know what? It was never any one moment when they said, hey, because really they kept, I, I mean, for the longest, their, their conversation, and you might relate to this, Dave, is make sure you got something to fall back on. Yeah, you know, yeah, was, yeah. That yeah. was the that was the biggest recognition that I was, had chosen this as a, 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 my career. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, my dad would have given me that advice if he knew enough about the industry to actually give advice. So I think he was just so clueless about the whole thing. He was kind of bemused about it, but he didn't have any sense of what the odds might be or or that sort of thing. So so I didn't have that particular uh, challenge. But so how interesting. So you wind up, you're this young writer. Are you 23 years old, something like that, when you're a writer's assistant on at, at Happy Days? No, I'm old as can you cuss on this? I you can know. cut. You can say the f word. You can say whatever you. I, want. I was old as fuck, David. I didn't see. I didn't start. You see, I worked and did. You know, I was married. But by, by the time I got, got into this business, I've been through two wives. You oh know, my! Okay. Several careers. You know, I was. Uh, by the time I wound up on uh, on Happy Days as uh, 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 the uh, assistant. I was uh, maybe like 20, 29, 30. I was, okay. I was 30. I was at yeah. least 30. Well, in a way, you know what? It's kind of, I think it's inspiring because, you know, people, there there is a, a bizarre idea out there, I think, in some 20-somethings minds that, oh my God, if I don't, if I'm not on the track by 23, there's no hope. You know, I can't, I can't stop down and change my mind to do something else. And you did. And and you obviously did so extremely successfully. Um, but tell me what happened from there. So you start, did you write a script while you were at Happy Days? Did you try to write a spec script of Happy Days? Or did well, they give you an assignment? Or what did you do to sort of hustle your way in well, into that? Well, I was an assistant for a couple of years. And, you know, prior to that, you know, my, my last really paying job, I had an assistant. I was like, yeah, well, I, I, was like, I can't. I, I was there for two years. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to give this up. But then at that time, because, you know, Gary Marshall was uh, was one of my mentors and obviously is his show. And I worked for his sister. And, you know, uh, uh, at one point he just came in and said, you know, uh, uh, you can write as good as uh, folks up there, uh, you know, go upstairs. You have an office. 
and a shingle with your name on it. What he didn't tell me was I was an apprentice writer and that I was going to be making less than I did as an assistant, but <laughs> hey, nevertheless, <laughs> but, but I gladly uh, 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 took that opportunity, you know. So uh, that was, uh, you know, the moment that uh, 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 everything changed for me when I, when I got that shot, you know. And your there. shingle went on that door. That must have been very exciting. Did you feel a surge of excitement from that development or well, were you kind of more anxious? Oh no, I was, I was, oh, come on. I, I was, I was confident to a fault. I was, I can't, you know, I should have been kicked out of the business so many times. Cause I was just, I, you know, I, I was, you, I, I can say as your, your colleague, you know, when, when we were working together that you did have confidence and a swagger, not in an obnoxious way at all, but I think that was a distinct advantage. I think it makes people feel good in a business where everybody's afraid of something or other failing at something, you know, there's just a lot of anxiety. And I think you never, you know, you always exuded confidence and were upbeat. Is that, is that your nature or was that your defense mechanism? Well, I was just from pure stupidity. I mean, you know, when I first got onto the happy day as the writer's assistant, I, you know, I've never been to a taping. You know, I've, I've been to one taping. That was when I met everybody. And then the second taping I was at was after the time I got hired. So, you you, you know, back in the day in the stage, they they shoot multi, it's a multicam show. And in between shows, they would gather on the set, even while the audience was still there, and get notes from the network and, and, and the studio, right? So there'd be the producers, the director, Jerry Paris was was there, you know, Henry, and they all huddled, and they had these, they, the network was giving some note, and they didn't, couldn't seem to come up with the answer. And it was obvious to me. I said, well, why don't you do this, that, and the other? Interesting. And it was just like a silence. And Jerry Perry said, well, what the fuck is going on? I'm getting note from PAs now? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, from what I understand, that would be very in character for Jerry Paris, by the way. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it was very, I mean, no, and, and I was learning that too. I didn't know. I said, ooh, I don't think I was supposed to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> did they take the note or did they reject it? Oh, no, I don't know what they did. I just <laughs> shut the hell up, David, at that point. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been there and we've all made that particular move at some meeting or other. Believe me, I've got 30 of those I can share with you too. Um, that's awesome. So you went up there, you got the shingle on the outside of the office. What's the first script that you deliver? Was it there? Was it elsewhere? Well, actually, I had already written the script. Hmm. Yeah, I had already, I had just got my script assignment, but that was it. You know, it, it, right. it was it was doing a strike. It was all kind of stuff. It, it took me two years to sell Gary. I, Gary Marshall taught me how to pitch. Interesting. It, because he gave, you know, the thing about Gary, and look, Gary is a, a mentor to write. Gary loves writers. Okay. He really, and you know this through your own experience, David, that he probably started half the writers in this town. At one point, it was higher than that. He literally, because he's the one that created the whole apprentice program. It didn't exist. WGA didn't have one. They would find him. He would do it anyway. He was he was the first one to have like 10 writers on a staff. Because prior to that... You, I didn't you, realize that. That's very interesting. He was the originator of the big... The big writing the big, staff. Oh yeah, those big, the big staffs. Because prior to that, you, there'd just be a, a, a head writer and maybe one other guy, and 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 shows use freelancers as uh, you know as a, a ad hoc sort of a, a writing staff. So that you know, Gary was a, a big mentor, and I was he fortunately took a liking to me because I played baseball. Uh, oh, and, and only kind of good, but I, I hustled a lot. So he he asked me, "What do you want to?" Uh, after a I hit a home run in a game, the first game I was in. So at, that Sunday, we used to play in the, the old showbiz league. And was so that he, was that the same game that like my mentor and original boss Brandon Tartikoff would play in? Was he in? Was that the same set of games, or was that a different? Yeah, game? yeah. There was a showbiz league in the valley that all the shows and networks participated in. Everybody played, and 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 Happy Days was even. We traveled the world. That's a that's another thing that happened. So it, it got. It was deeper. It was part of the culture. I went out, got on the team, hit a home run. Gary shows up at my desk, my assistant desk, like Monday uh, morning. It's like, so what do you want to do? Because Gary believed you work like you played. 
right? So he, I said, well, I want, want to write. So he pitched me the whole season, what they were going to do, the direction of that season, and gave me carte blanche to pitch to him anytime. I pitched right. to Gary for two years. And I was never, by this time, Happy Days had been on the air like 30 years, you know. I, I, so it, 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 it probably at that point had literally jumped the shark. Oh, they had jumped the yeah. shark and jumped it again. <laughs> and, and so, uh, so I, look, I look that up, by the way, for those who may be watching this video somewhere. I'm not going to explain it here, but just look up the phrase jump the shark. Yeah. Just type that into Google. You'll get an interesting background on that phrase and how it's related to happy days. So, so I'm, you know, I'm pitching. I would, you know, I was diligent. I do three outlines for three pitches. I pitch it to him. And every time he, he would, Either they'd done it before, or there's something wrong with. I, I would never, you know, and and I was literally doing this like every week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so finally, after two years, I go in there and I pitch two ideas, and he turns them both down. Oh, and I said, that's okay. a heartbreak. He says, anything else? I said, no, nope, that's it. He said, okay, better luck next time. I'm leaving. I get up to leave, and I then I go into my Columbo routine. I said, Gary. I do have this <laughs> one idea. I can't quite figure it out. You know, Fon by this time, the Fonzie, they're like 100 years old, so Fonzie's a teacher. <laughs> you know, I said, I, I, Fonzie, he, he's a substitute teacher. So Fonzie teaches something in class he's not supposed to and gets in trouble. And I can't figure it out. Gary says, Fonzie teaches a sex education class. He said, now that's a TV log line. You've got your first script. Go do the outline. Oh, that's okay. great. Thank you, Gary. Very, I walk, I walk out. Technique, by the way, by the way, Ralph, my hat's off to you. I've, I've got to use that sometime myself. Yeah, I, I walk out. I got a third outline in my, my little folder. It's titled Fonzie Teaches a Sex Education Class. I'd already written that. I, so I just, <laughs> I just, I, when I finally realized the secret to pitching is, it's got to be his idea. At least he has to think it is. And so, boom. That's <laughs> That's been my secret of pitching. I always leave enough for people to join in, and that way they can claim ownership too. The minute they claim ownership, trust me, you're probably going to make a sale. When I when I first started um, out, Ralph, um, working for Mr. Tartikoff, one of the one of the questions I had for my direct bosses was, "What kind of ideas does Brandon like?" And one of my very wise bosses said. Brandon likes Brandon's ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, got it. Okay, good. Um, hey, and I just, by the way, I David, that's pretty much everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a certain universality from that. By the way, we've got a hello from Seattle. We've got a hello from LA. We've got um, uh, Retta Moore, who's one of our kind of VIPs at HAPS. He says, it's never too late to become an astronaut, Ralph. Um, <laughs> somebody, somebody else's Alexa was triggered in the same way yours was. Uh, we've got uh, hearts being exchanged by people like Shirley Baker. Um, it's really fun because we've got people all over the world who are watching this, and and it's great. I I will say I will say this, Ralph. You've always been confident, and it's fun to be around your confidence. Have you ever just been in a panic? Have you ever just really like? you know, at some juncture of your career, just been scared to death or, or does that not part of your constitution? And then I have oh, a follow-up. I'm, right I'm, I'm absolutely terrified right now talking to you. It's, it's the older, you know, you know what, there's something about ignorance and bliss or <laughs> something people say. I, I remember the first time I ever pitched to a network, I was, uh, uh, it was Peter Roth when he was at Steve, running Stephen Cannell. Oh, and, wow. And he and I, I rode with Stephen Candle to the pitch. We had the series we we're going to pitch of the hip hop series, and there was this big time writer. I forget his name, and Quincy Jones, and we all met. You know, up at, I mean, Candle drove in the ABC when it was over in Century City. He drove up. We, we just got out of his car and walked in the ABC. It wasn't even in the parking lot. And I'm like, what is this? I've never, I've never seen anything like it. We, How the other half live? Yes. We, we, we get into the room. There's like 40 executives uh, uh, between the two uh, uh, entities talking. They're laughing, and and Quincy, you know, Quincy Jones, and they this, that, and the other. And suddenly, so someone says, "So what's the idea?" 
And in unison, everybody turned toward me. I mean, and Tony Kranz was in that too. You, you remember Tony? Of course. Everybody turned toward me. They said, Ralph, well, David, no one told me I had to pitch anything. Oh, no. Oh, man. Oh, there was, there was no one ever said, Ralph, you have to pitch. That wasn't even an idea. So I said, and I looked at him and said, y'all want me to talk? He said, yeah. I said, okay, cool. I said, Let me, I just made that shit up on the spot. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that was, was I scared? Absolutely not. I was like, I can't believe they're going to let me talk. <laughs> it's all you know, the whole story. And they go, and they go, great. We love it. And Tony comes out. I said, Ralph, you were great. And I'm going, Tony, was that the network? He said, yeah. I said, that's the network. He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to make some money in this. Book. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. That is an inspirational story. I love that. Um, so Gary Marshall was obviously an early mentor. Were there any other mentors? And how did you how did you seek mentorship and how did you go about it? Was it a systematic approach on your part to to seek no. mentorship? Or because I think well, that's always kind of part of the recipe for success. And I'm intrigued by how how that worked for you. Well, you always gravitate toward people who will at least talk to you. So uh, <laughs> that start was, there. It's <laughs> wise to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Hal DeWitt, who was my acting instructor, was really the guy who gave me. Look, as a black man in this business, Hal had been through a lot of stuff. He, you know, uh, uh, he was very good friends with iconic black performers and artists, and uh, through him, I I got introduced to a uh, uh, depth of the business uh, from the black side, which was, you know, most people wouldn't have access to. And uh, he gave me a, a, a idea of mental toughness, what it would take, what I would run up against. He gave me a preview of that. And he was someone I ran things against uh, uh, as I got started. And uh, then, you know, running to Gary, just, you know, that was a, uh, a, uh, the luck of the draw, if you will, but even Walter Kempley before who hired me, I, I certainly count him as a mentor. And then, you know, people, things that were happening, I met Michael Moy, and I know Michael will uh, say, I, I had mentored Ralph, but he did. And he, he was an example. He's the one, I, uh, uh, he and Ron hired me on Married with Children, but Michael was just a, uh, uh, and people, if you don't know who he is, look it up. Michael Moy, M O Y E. He created, you know, many the creator of Married with Children, the yeah, one of the greatest Married with Children of all time. Yeah, yeah but, you know, uh, two two seven. He, he did a bunch of stuff. He's he's so rich he left Hollywood. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, he did. <laughs> I would occasionally get these Christmas cards from him and his wife in Connecticut, and they were like on. The, the kind of paper that you go, this must be sourced in like, you know, there must be three places in the world you can buy paper this expensive. You know, it, you, you knew he had done well. Oh, 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 yeah. Michael did well when they were really paying. You, you know, yeah, I, right. you, you know, You're when, so syndication, right. when syndication, yeah. you yeah. know, married children did a billion dollars twice. Wow. It might be on a third cycle for all I know right now. Wow. So uh, it's, uh, 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 Michael is one of the most talented, most brilliantly funny, uh, 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 equally good with uh, uh, funny and story. He was like, and you know, and working with Ron, and I got I got to include uh, Ron Levitin, who's you know passed away, but Ron was uh, uh, taught me that you could be cynical and still be happy. So, <laughs> so, so that was. Uh, uh, that was it. But then I, you know, I include others, people I count as friends, you know, uh, Stan Lathan is, you know, my best friend, but he was just, you know, everybody looked up was, you know, I knew Stan for five years. He, he wouldn't even talk to me. You know, I mean, that was, that was like, you know, was like, they're going to stay. He, he wouldn't say nothing to me. So we became, once we became friends, it was like, oh God, I'm friends with, with the guy. I admire uh, the most in the world. So uh, that's so cool. So, um, you know, I, I, th I have a corny question to ask, but I have to ask it, which would be what would the Ralph of today advise younger Ralph? You know, what, what, what's the, what's the advice you would have given your younger self? Cause I think some of the people who watch this would be intrigued to know that. 
don't ever sell real estate. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent advice. And by the way, like I don't even, it, that one hurts, by the way, because uh, I give the you same know, advice to myself. You know, because when you get it young, you get, those are the young prices. When you get older, you be going, what? Yeah, uh, exactly. So, oh so my. It, don't sell it. And if you can, have a home outside of LA. Oh, that's interesting. Work here. That's interesting. And why do you say that? I mean, well, I can infer, but why is it in your case? A, it's cheaper. Yep. Uh, B, uh, uh, it, it allows you to have some sort of connection with real life, the real world, you know, have friends and do things outside of what we do here. I, you know, I used to be... I used to, uh, look, David, one of the good things about being a writer and getting your start like when you're 30 is you kind of have a life experience that you draw upon. But when you live in this town, it stunts your growth because everything, it's its all consuming. It, it, That's it really, so true. Uh, uh, I, would have work, to, I would have to reluctantly agree that that's, that that's true. Yeah. As, when you work, it's 24 hours a day for real. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's like when you... When, you know, I had a bunch of friends who, you know, there's a lot of people you wonder where they go and they all moved to Santa Barbara. It was like the people that used to be like, they get a producer. I said, what are you doing up here? Man, don't you miss the business? And, and you know, I'd never quite understood their answers till I got to be an executive producer. And it just, it was 24 seven and it just grabbed all my life. And I said, Oh, Oh, now I get it. It's hard to find people to do these jobs because this is this is bullshit. This is crazy. This is this is this just sucks the life out of you. Yeah. So it it I I mean that's what happens. And on the way up, it's happening. You know, I mean, I you know, you know the hours we put on on the Dabney show. We, I, we I've spent I the, I've I've spent an unbelievable number of hours between 12 midnight and 6 a.m. doing work more so than the average human being, I'm sure. Much yeah, more. It, it, it was absolutely crazy. So I, uh, as a, to me, I say to a lot of uh, young folks today, I said, look, hey, it's not for everybody, but if you can't get a house somewhere else, you know, raise your family somewhere else, come here, work. And when you're not working, go back. And, yeah. you know, we, we, we both, we all know a lot of people. I, I think of Dave Chappelle. That's what he does. I, 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 yeah. I, I would definitely recommend that. Right. Um, Ralph, you talked about, you know, that acting school in West Hollywood and um, it, you've had, you know, you have an ex you've had an experience of being a person of color in the industry, starting out in that period and, 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 you know, four decades now into a fifth decade, how has it changed for, uh, you know, for a person of color in the industry? Let's say that there's somebody out there today that's wanting to start out. Uh, is it going to be a rocky road for them? Are there going to be special problems and challenges today? And how did that, how or if did that compare to what it was like when you were getting started? Yeah, well, I mean, look, when I, when I was getting started, it was, it was terrible. So uh, there were no black showrunners or anything. Anybody, you know, it, it was what it was. We were, you know, the main way we interface with the business is in front of the camera. So the behind the camera uh, uh, evolution hadn't taken place. Today is a much it's a much different story. Uh, uh, it's not without the same challenges, but there is much more access. You know, I look. I I remember. This is a, I remember one time there was a, there was, you know, black folks going, we, we, we got to have stuff on TV. You know, you know, the network's got to put some shows on. There was a big protest. We were all down at the uh, Mark Tabor with a big, a uh, uh, big confab. And I remember this uh, uh, black woman who was with the FCC got on and she said, well, you know, we're going to think, don't worry, things are going to change. We're going to have all these channels. And so instead of just like three large slices of the pie, they're going to be all these smaller slices of the pie and everybody will be able to get in. And at the time, there was like a sudden pause. It was just a silence fell over the room. And then someone said, but, but, 
but we want a big slice of the pie. <laughs> and, and, but no one understood what she was saying. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that it, you know, uh, cable shows would overtake networks and that you would make more money with a show that was getting a, 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 a 1.2 than we were making with shows getting 30.0 back then. You know, it was no one understood and no one envisioned at all streaming at that and, and mobile entertainment and all that. So what has happened right now is there's such a demand for product that this this genuine opportunity for folks. And that and the other thing, which is because I'm old as hell and the time since then uh, we're approaching the point of minority, majority minority in this country. I mean, you mentioned I'm doing a, a, a show for a, a D plus a, a, a reboot of Proud Family, which, uh, quite frankly, when we first did it, you know, it, it, black people loved it. You know, Disney was like, ah, oh, okay, we didn't. You know, we did four seasons. That's enough. Uh, now. Uh, the 11 to 14 has been majority minority since 2018. It's really so, down. Yeah. So, so what this is, it's a, it's a new day. So, you know, when they started D plus, they said, boom, we got a call. We went and Bruce and I went to pitch another show and they said, Hey, you guys want to do the proud family. Now we've been begging them to redo the proud family, proud family every year since we went off the air. But hey, we're, we're coming back. The demographics shift. So mm -hmm. it's the first place it hits is in the younger category. And it just inches up from there. So that's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity. Then you put on what unfortunately has come to light, uh, uh, not unfortunately, what the unfortunate events, uh, 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 Mr. Floyd and, and, and everybody else is getting killed by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, has uh, uh, made you know, a lot of these corporations realize that they have to do some, have to make some changes. And so what I'm seeing for the first time ever is I'm seeing legitimate opportunities. And I'm not talking about apprentice gigs or, you know, unpaid internships, you know, all that stuff where people are like hiring folks for legitimate jobs at all levels from beginning to the uh, uh, very beginning to the very top. So in that sense, I think it's a, a, a big change. How long it will last? Because, you know, we get these little bubbles of, you know, consciousness suddenly, you know, hey, we, you know, we need to. I think right now the, the word is authentic voice. I hate that word, by the way, authentic. I'm, mean, you know, I, I, OK, anyway, that phrase or whatever it is. But they're looking for authentic voices to uh, 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 speak for the characters and, and to create certain types of shows for certain audiences. And so that's a, a genuine opportunity. I think it's especially a genuine opportunity for younger talent. You know, I think younger folks are getting chances now that they would not have gotten five years ago. Even. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, that, to that, but has it changed really? No, it's still, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of still the same game. We're kind of still having the same conversations uh, 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 about, you know, what a show should be or what a show could be. Right. And, well, well, possibly my favorite piece of work in the Ralph Farquhar oeuvre would be South Central. And you were writing the, about these themes like way before everybody else. Um, did you feel like, you were just like, no one got it. Like no one understood. Uh, well, it's um, no, I felt the audience understood. Uh, 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 I just, I, I don't think the network cared. There was no one at the network. Uh, um, I think, I think Rose Catherine uh, uh, Pinckney, who's now at BET, she was the only black executive over there in the, you know, in the development side of things. And then she had left to go run uh, uh, Andre Harrell's uh, company in New York, and uh, so we were like on our own. There was no, there was no champion. You know, we were. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I don't know if people know it. South Central was about a single mom uh, 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 raising her uh, three kids 
uh, in South Central back when S South Central was was living up to that that title of being South Central, and uh, so and 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 the pilot opens. It's about her losing her job, and she hasn't told her kids, and she has to go to the market, and she has to put food back when she doesn't have enough to pay, and you know it's it was uh, 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 sort of came at you. It was quote unquote a sitcom, but it wasn't. We shot a single camera, handheld. It was uh, uh, and you uh, had really and you had Lorenz Tate in one of the leads, and he was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he was he, one of the finest he, young actors in the business at that time, and and. Uh, and, and 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 Tina Lifford played the mom. She was absolutely she amazing. Was herb, yeah. And yeah. Uh, 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 and then there were, but then we got a note one time because the opening episode, the daughter was kept. Who was the responsible one? Was mom? You got to help me get. Uh, uh, you got to help me. I want to get this cross color jacket. Can you help me get a cross color jacket? If you know anything about uh, '80s culture or '90s cultures, cross color jackets was like the most expensive thing you could ever ask for. So the mom yelled at her. And so the network said, oh, come on, please. Can we, can she please get the jacket? We said, well, no. We said, why? I said, because mom cost doesn't have much. any money. <laughs> she doesn't have any money. She just, she just lost her job. And they, they were silenced for a second. They said, well, can she put it on a credit card? Oh, my God. Now, at the um, time, <laughs> if you live in South Central, you know, they didn't give They didn't give credit, credit cards. Like yeah, no, there was like Olympic. redlining of people's. Yes. They yeah. redlined. You could not if you live south of Olympic, you couldn't get a credit card in LA. I said, they don't have credit cards. They can't. They said, well, God, you know, we really it just seems so bleak. And I, I, I and I, I said, I thought for a second. I said, okay, I guess she she can put the jacket on layaway. Silence. And and let me guess. I'm gonna guess. Mm. Somebody asked, "What was layaway?" What's layaway? I said, <laughs> I, I've never heard you tell the story, but I, but I know my people. <laughs> What's layaway? <laughs> so I'm going, hey, you know, but that's you know, hey, that's what we had to do, go through back then. Uh, that's exasperating, by the way, because that tells you there's nobody in that building that has the vaguest understanding. Of what Americans are dealing with. Of what I may have experienced. Yeah. 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 What, what most Americans have experienced, if white, black, or otherwise. People know what this is. Yeah. You know, and so that 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 hasn't necessarily changed. That story <laughs> distills sort of an entire narrative about our culture and the times all into one incident. I love it. Uh this is a cute question. We have another top commenter, Lenny P says, question for Ralph. Would you ever consider creating a new show called Hapsy Nights? We definitely have quite a cast of characters in here. And they you have no idea, Ralph, how how on the nose she is being about that. We've got amazing characters from all over the world. I'd like to thank Jason Torriello giving us the great interview award. That's always nice to hear from our, our peeps. Um, hi, sweet P Kim. Um I wanted to ask a couple of uh, a couple of other questions that I thought people might be interested in. Ralph, any books that you read that were important to you, and and or any that you would recommend to others in this category of getting started or in, inspiration for for uh, the career that that people are looking for? I didn't read any books. I, let me tell you. I'm, I'm, I, I, look, I'm I'm not you know shit. When I got out of school, I said I'm never going to read another book in my life. Uh, that's what education taught me. But having said that, uh, uh, you know, writing, I, you know, uh, the, actually the best books, and I forget the title, the best books on writing were written by critics back in the day. And, and that's where I learned all about the classic three act structure. And that was the best thing for me. Uh, uh, it teaches you everything you need to know about uh, 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 dramatic structure. And uh, I, I don't remember the title because I'm old. And, uh, <laughs> well, if, we, if you if it comes to you, I'll post it when we when we have this archive of all these videos. I'll uh, I will supplement with uh, with a couple of notes. I got, but you know what? I this is what I one thing I was was merciless about. I did uh, like Lonnie Elder the Third. He wrote Sounder, an amazing writer. I mean. I couldn't carry, you know, I couldn't carry his typewriter or any, anywhere. Lonnie is just amazing. And I wormed my way into his life where I would just go 
every day he had an apartment in uh, 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 where he used to write. I used to go there and sit with him during his break for an hour, it, literally every day, just to hear him tell me stories about his existence, his experience in, in Hollywood, because he comes out of stage in New York and, you know, uh, you know, work with just, you know, uh, Robert Hooks was a good friend. Robert Hooks would come by. That was my education. My education was, you know, reaching out to and spending time with people who had done it before. And, and I would just suck up that knowledge where there's, you know, Stan, like I said, again, Stan Lathan is another one. The, the acting school was Kilpatrick Cambridge. So it was Lincoln Kilpatrick and Ed Cambridge. Lincoln Kilpatrick was a top uh, character actor in Hollywood. Ed Cambridge was was the top stage manager on Broadway. So these this that you couldn't. They knew what they were talking about. Yeah, you couldn't pay. No. You couldn't pay for. You could not pay uh, and buy what I got uh, from these guys. You Interesting. Were there any um, pieces of work from other writers that were inspirational to you, like screenplays? Uh, you know any script episode movie something that you were like that is so inspirational that is just that is any any of those that were sort of uh uh stick out uh cooley high eric monte was a movie yeah, like Michael legend. Directed. Legend. yeah. And, uh, it was um i just thought the honesty of it it wasn't a polished movie but it was way more effective than any those uh, John Hughes movies I was seeing then, this was like, you know, I'm from Chicago, so th this was how I grew up. And it just spoke to me. I just thought Eric had completely, you could tell there was no insertion in terms of, they weren't filtering their experience through someone else's experience. And I thought, I, you know, Michael Schultz has done a lot of great movies, but I that's, uh, uh, including Crush Groove, which I wrote, which right. is not, which is not doesn't doesn't compare to Cooley High. Cooley High was like that to me. That was it. I because I like to write from my experience, and uh, uh, you know I like to have fun, but I like to have a little bit of message, and I always like to have a, a, a heart in it. And that that movie uh, uh, accomplished all of that. All right. Well, for a lot of people, by the way, they could go to the grave happy if they had written Crush Groove. But uh, so I think you're underselling yourself, but. I am curious, what is, is there any piece of work that you have done that you are most proud of in your entire career? Most proud of, well, uh, I look, I think the most innovative thing was what myself and Michael Whitehorn did, which, which was South Central. I, it, I, I loved it. I put I it up against it. anything. It was, it, it, at the time, David, it just half hours weren't done that way. No one had ever done a half hour like that. We were, I, you know, every everything from the way we, what what was on the page, to how we shot it, how we altered the form, you know, I, we was you know we were multi cam, we were single, we were handheld multi cam. We did that, you know, we we did some crazy stuff that was it was it was a great piece of work. I'm kind of hoping that with the uh, 99 million channels, that someday that, for instance. And a lot of short order series could be seen because I think that would be a it would be they, would they show up. it every now and then uh, it'll show on something like you know TV one or show it or something oh, like cool. that. But it you know if that I'm 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 really really proud of that and 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 no pun intended uh, the Proud family uh, uh, which kind of shocked me the first time around we did it because it. Being animation, the weird thing about it, it was more grounded and had more human qualities to it than the live action shows I'd done. And it was yeah. like, and the way people responded to it was uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, amazing. I mean, right now, I just, in fact, I just got off a notes meeting on an episode we're doing, and, and people were, it, this one particular episode, people were saying it's so emotional. I was, didn't expect it to be. And, you know, uh, um, so the Proud family is uh, uh, certainly uh, one of the things I'm uh, extremely proud of. Um, Ralph, what's the toughest 
lesson that you've learned along the way in your career? Oh, the toughest lesson. Hmm. You know what? I, I don't know. I've had any tough lessons. I, and, and Knock on wood, because there's always one way. There's a the Yiddish way. word, kinahora, you say right after you uh, <laughs> you utter an, uh, uh, something like that. Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> I know Melba will know it. Well, she'll, know the, she'll know the word. <laughs> you know, I'm, um, uh, well, I'm, shit, I don't know if I can talk. You know, I'm trying to get my points. <laughs> I'm trying to get my back end points. So that's. That's oh, I see. Lesson. Got it. Well, that's a good, that is a good lesson. You know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's financial, uh, you know, like there's a lot of people, we know many of them, extremely talented artists and writers and stuff like that, who just like, you know, when someone presents a stack of documents, whether it's a agent or an attorney or whatever, they're just, you know, signing and not asking questions. And so I think that's an interesting, you know, that's. Oh, a, I, I asked the question. Lesson. I ask the questions and I, you know, I just say it straight up, but they still don't want to pay you. I, <laughs> yes. you know, I got, my paperwork is in all great order. It's like, did, what? Did, really did you ever, gonna, you're did, just not going to pay me? Did you ever see the, the, the documentary American pimp by any chance? American pimp. I'm not sure. An amazing documentary. And, and, and they basically, the structure of the documentary is they go to these pimps and they're talking and they talk about, their approach to marketing or finding women and doing this and that. And each one is a different character and they all have their own unique stories and approaches to the business. And then the documentarian asks the question, what percent do you share with your women? And every single one of them says zero. <laughs> it's just literally yeah. like hey, one you know, after been, the other. No, after I've been the, it's like percent, you know, like zero, nothing, absolutely not. Like literally they all, all these people who sounded so different, they, they all have the same answer. And I just thought it was just a, a, a fascinating um, commentary on the, on the, the ethos of capitalism, how, how, how consistent it is. But uh, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that, I mean, look, that, that's, that's real and it's getting trickier even with this whole new uh, uh, era we're in with technology and the ability to actually know how many times something is showing and who's playing it and who's watching it. Yeah. And it's a, look, it's, it's like on the streaming, let's try this on. The streamers don't tell you how many people watch your show. Wow. So, so now you don't have the information to renegotiate with these guys or to negotiate with the next guy. It's a, a, a it's Fat, kind of deep. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we've got a, a commenter, a top commenter named Knowledge Shabazz, who says hello from Lynchburg. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Lisa Sansusi. Thank you for the award. Really appreciate it. Um, Ralph, here's a funny uh, uh, question I would ask. Um, you have a lot of talent, but how much has luck played in your success? Oh, it's hey, I I think luck plays into everybody's success. You, um, the, the older I get, Ralph, the more I'm like, oh my god, you cannot overestimate that component. To well, especially to quote success unquote, you know, like the rewards and things like that, because. So much of it has to do with timing and when an opportunity arises and what the economic circumstances are at that particular time and moment. You know, when Danny Arnold was writing Barney Miller, I remember when I started in the business, that was the first time that a writer got a check for double digit millions for their syndication interest in a show. And it was Danny Arnold on Barney Miller. And word went around town, Danny Arnold got a $17 million check or something, yep. something like that. And, you know, Danny Arnold probably couldn't imagine that he would ever get a check like that. Oh, no, I know. And, I and you know, wife. yeah, you know, so so it's just kind of interesting that um, and Malcolm Gladwell, I don't know if you since you claim you don't read books, but uh, but I bet you've read a Malcolm Gladwell book or two. I'm just guessing Malcolm Gladwell um, um, wrote, you know, basically was talking about the four biggest tycoons of the 19th century who made, you know, amounts of money that are staggering. And part of his, the explanation is 
they all happen to have the good fortune to be born between a very tiny window when massive fortunes could be accumulated because of what was happening in society with industrialization and money and banks and so forth. And, you know, they couldn't have intended to have that career. And if they were born 10 minutes, 10 years earlier or 10 years later, they could never have been that wealthy. So I'm with you on that, on the luck thing for sure. Well, well I, the thing I had to learn, David, you know, cause I was going, you know, I was going, you know, as a black man, I'm not getting opportunities in this business. And at the time I was just completely drugged out of my mind too. That was another thing that was going on. I get sober and I go back into uh, uh, the, I, I'm not even sure I uh, uh, can be in the business because I feel like I might, that's the reason I, I lost, I lost, I might lose my sobriety. And then, uh, and Michael, uh, Michael Moy called me and said, hey, you know, we want to put you on staff. I didn't even return his call. And then finally came in and he said, look, we, we want to put you on staff. You know, you're written up freelance. We like it. And the show was Married with Children. I said, Michael, I'm not, I don't know if I could do this. Let me think about it. And I went and, you know, I talked to my wife and said, are you out of your mind? We can't pay the bills. You're going to go take that job. <laughs> and I, well, I play a very important role in many men's lives. By the way. And oftentimes <laughs> yeah. it's for exactly that kind of advice. Yep. And I go back and I, I, I do it. I said, well, let, let's see what happens. I'll see if it work out. But I tried something people who get sober, I, I got sober, was, you know, I was going to stay out of my way. I was just do what was before me. I was going to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I can't tell you, I didn't do any, all I did was say yes. I got a new agent and he was, uh, you probably know, Ian Greenstein and Ian was new. Right. Yeah. South African guy, he's going... He's all excited. Ralph, he says, what, what do you want? Uh, 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 what's your goal? What do you want to make? I said, Ian, I want to make $75,000 a year. I want to wow. get up to that. Oh, he says, oh, you'll be making a half a million. I said, Ian, relax. Just get work on the 75. Okay. <laughs> Ian, for the record, was correct. Uh, but, uh, but, 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 but yeah, know. a year later, I made a half a million. No, I did nothing. I'm telling you, all I did was just show up to work every day. Isn't that something? No. I, I mean, you, so, but the luck, what was the luck of the draw? Married with children. But married with children wasn't a huge hit out the gate. What what happened? Right. So, late sure. then, Carrie uh, uh, Reculta called in and said, started calling, organized a boycott against the show, saying they got a bunch of naked women and they're doing crazy things. And people started saying, what? Was the best, <laughs> yeah, it was the best publicity ever. Yes. She unwittingly made that a hit show. Yeah. yeah. So, and after yeah. that, none of us on that show ever looked back. That was just pure luck. That, right. that was not me. I had nothing to do with it. Well, you, you know, I, I, I totally appreciate what you're saying. I, I actually I will also just chime in something that comes to mind and it, and it, it goes back to when you were talking about that acting school that you were attending. Yeah. I attended an acting school for a very short time. Uh, I really, I was going to direct the project and I wanted to learn how to talk to actors. So a wise mentor of mine once said, you know what, you really ought to go to an acting school and kind of have the experience, like, you know, go through the classes and watch the teachers work and yeah. so forth. And then you'll, you know, you'll be more than just auditing. You'll actually experience it. And I did. And I remember that, you know, they would implore you to practice all the time, every day. And I remember that at some point, um, there was a woman who had been uh, really very diligently practicing every day, working her ass off, but not, but struggling and not, you know, not doing so well in her scenes. And then there was some slacker that would get up there and just kill everybody, you know, like he was so good. And she, at the end of the of every class, there'd be this Q and A session and discussion. And she basically called out this guy and basically said, you know, I work my ass off every day. I practice, I do all the exercises. I do everything. I read all the books. I go see all the movies you recommend. And you know what? I get up here and I, and I lay an egg. And then that asshole, you know, he comes in here and I know he hasn't studied and I know he hasn't done this and I know he hasn't that. And he kills it, you know, and, and they, you know, basically asking the, the instructor, what do you have to say about that? 
And the instructor said, well, there is such a thing as talent. <laughs> so, so, so Ralph, you know, there is such a thing as talent. And, and what, the, what the rest of the audience doesn't know is you really have it. And I'm not just blowing smoke and I'm not, you know, it's like, now I'm not saying that's not all you have, you know, there's been a lot of work and there's been a, and there has been luck and there has been all that. But I think that it really helps to have talent and you've, you've got it. And I, I can vouch for it firsthand. So that always well, helps. I, and Well, thank you, David. Uh, I, I appreciate you. you will handle my next negotiation with Disney. So uh, <laughs> I'm more than happy to do that. But the, the, the clue though, I mean, and, and is not to get in the way of your talent. And, and that's the, the caveat I, I, you know, and sometimes we just have so many, you know, our insecurities, our, our desire to control things. This is, this is the last business where, you know, you have all these auteurs and people say they control, nobody controls anything. Come on, you, come on, you got, you do a movie, you got 200 people working for you, come on. The, the PA can sink that damn movie if they don't, don't do their job correctly. So it's a team sport, no matter what anybody says. And, and so you just have to, for me, it's been like, let go of that control and, uh, and doing of the, uh, 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 the projects and in terms of things that might come your way. You always hear, <laughs> I used to get interviewed, people said, what made you decide uh, to go on a comedy? I said, well, that was the first job I got. <laughs> what I, that what? What? I was going to go, hey, no, I'm going to hold out to that big drama. Come on, give me a break. We, now, we, I admire what? people who do that and can make that happen, but it's a, it's a, it's a hard way to do it. Let me we haven't, that. we haven't shared this. Uh, we didn't, we don't even know this about each other, but that's the same reason I got into comedy. It was where the job was. I got into the management training program at NBC. Comedy was the last place I wanted to be. I wanted to be in the TV movie division at that time. Yep. And if I couldn't be in the TV movie division, I wanted to be in the drama division. And, um, and instead I was in the comedy. So I was, and when I joined the comedy department, the, there was a headline in variety that, that said, is the situation comedy dead? It was the, it was the banner headline on the front page. So I'm like, okay, I'm joining the dead last network in the dead department. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, my career is going to go nowhere, but you know, who knows? You just, you kind of make, you might make the most of it. Now I think I've, I think it's probably the luckiest thing that ever happened. Oh, to me. Come on. Um, I, one last question. And then uh, you've been so generous with your time. We'll, we'll wrap up, but I, but when you mentioned the stuff about sobriety, I was very curious. Uh, is it, is it a, is Hollywood a place where a sober person can have a good time and prosper and, 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 and have a happy existence or is it very challenging? Uh, no, I, well, I've been sober for the last 35 years or something, something crazy. So it's, uh, uh, no, there's a huge support group here. That's and, awesome. Uh, that's, that, there's not a, uh, um, I don't, I don't personally, I didn't find it a uh, uh, difficult, uh, once I got to it, but right. uh, it's, 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 a. a uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of support here. I mean, there's a lot. So, That's a good. You know, I I I'm a, I've been to Burning Man many times, and people are always asking me, "Well, don't you have to do drugs and stuff like that to have you know to, to go to Burning Man?" And I said, "You know, the largest single camp at Burning Man with over a thousand people in it is a sober camp. So yeah. uh, you know, you find it." You find those pockets everywhere. Ralph, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to pass along that I, any question I didn't ask you? Um, um, none that I, I, you know. No, you've asked all the difficult questions, David. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, why I, am I here? You know, what is life all about? <laughs> we'll do that as part two. We'll do that as the, uh, as the sequel, if I'll, if I'll ever be able to persuade you to do it. Uh, Ralph, you've been an inspiration in my life, professionally and personally. Um, I've been so fortunate to work with you. I really appreciate your making the time to share your wisdom and stories with everybody else. Uh, okay. You're the best. Well, 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 thank you. And uh, I just want everybody to know, we look, we produced a little show that only made it, I don't know what, 10 ep how many episodes did we do? But we- You know, we did, I think, Ralph, we did- at least 18. 18. Okay. I think it was 19 or I think it might have been 19 or 20. 
I'm not sure. Was it 18? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. But we but we had a ball. We Can did. You, you uh, uh, Phil, and and Tom. That yes, we did. It was it was awesome. This was a show called Drexel's Class. For for those uh, who are curious about what we're referring to, it starred um, Dabney Coleman, you know, who was for my money the funniest man in television, um, and uh, Brittany Murphy, God rest her soul, and Jason yeah. Biggs. And uh, it was such a good time. You know, it was, I think back on it, I remember reading about the Lucy show and somebody, I think it was Vivian Vance was talking about the Lucy show. And she said, it was like going to a party every day. Every day was like a cocktail party. And that's how it felt to me to work on Drexel's class. Every day was like a party. And one of the reasons was I got to work with Ralph. I got to be in a room with R Ralph for hours a day and just hear him laugh and come up with great ideas and encourage people. And, and, and also you were a force that, you know, I was a high strung, you know, uh, you know, very anxious young producer. And you were kind of my mentor saying like, David, chill, this is going to be okay. We're going to, we're going to handle this. And I, 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 I still remember the mentorship you gave me and I, I, I deeply appreciate it, Ralph. You're the okay, best. Well, I'm glad I didn't discourage you from continuing on uh, your journey in this business. <laughs> you certainly did not. You were an inspiration and still are. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you guys all for the comments. So many, uh, so many people are thanking you here. Um, uh, Vegan Doe, uh, Shabazz, um, uh, Takara says this was a great interview. Thank you for your time and sharing. Doe Darling says enjoyable interview. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you guys. Peter, thank you for your help and support. Um, and uh, join us next time. I hope you're all enjoying the HAPS platform, and I'll be back again with another interview with Getting Started. Thanks again, Ralph. Okay, thank you, David.